Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 29, verse 11, the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. And Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight was a melody sweeter than song in celestial.
Um, today again was is similar to the last time I was up here, which is always a privilege. Um, I don't take this lightly. I'm more nervous sitting and waiting. It seems like it takes forever than I, when I actually get up here. So I just solicit your prayers and your attention. And also, um, we do have uh, brothers and sisters in Birmingham. And I just want to keep them in prayer as well, like as we go through the service today. So as you can see, thank you, sir. The title of our sermon is What Does God Want? This is a question that we all should have some sort of answer for. But as Christians, we shouldn't know this, the answer to this. And today, we're going to use the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to try to help us to get um, maybe biblical and spiritual um, prophecy proof as to what we really believe. So um, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this opportunity that we can hear a word from you, Lord. And that's exactly what we need. We need to hear a word from you today. You don't need to hear me and my opinion, but we need to hear from you. So please show up for us. Speak because your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The story is told several years ago, a student in seminary class stood to his feet and announced to his professor, I don't believe in God. The professor was unraveled and replied, Describe this God you don't believe in. After the student had described an unloving and vengeful God, the professor confessed, I don't believe in a God either. I think that this little story kind of could help us to, to factor into this, this sermon. And again, what does um, God want? We as Christians should know the answer to this question. Our Bible tells us, and today we should be doing nothing more than a refresher course. Now open your Bibles, please, and put up, please, Soren, Genesis 1-1. Genesis 1-1. Amen. All right. So what we have here, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we start with Genesis because that's the beginning. And we wanted to know, we want to have answers from the Bible as to what God wants. So as we see with the verse, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to create heaven and earth so please keep your mind open 
and just think on the words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Now skip on to verse 27. Same Genesis 1, but verse 27. And it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So again, the question is answered again. God wanted to create man and woman, but in his image. That's what he wanted, and that's what he done. So we have a place for him to stay, and stars for them to admire, and sun and moon, and now you have the creation that was his crowning act. The, 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 the key word to this 27th verse, he created man in his image. I looked up image, and one of the um, definitions is exact likeness or semblance. Exact likeness or semblance. That's how God created man. Or the other um, description, a person strikingly like another person. And for example, she is the image of her mother. That was the, that was the definition, <clears throat> excuse me, from the dictionary. So, God created man in his image to occupy the earth that he created and the heavens that he created. That's what he done. So we have in education page 15 says, when Adam came from the creator's hand, he bore his own physical, mental, and spiritual nature, a likeness to his maker. God created man in his own image, Genesis 127. And it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he, he, sh he should reveal this image. The more fully reflect the glory of the creator, all his facilities were capable of developing, development, their capacity and vigor were to continually increase. So the planet go ahead is clear. But something happened. Through listening to and believing and obeying the old serpent, Adam and Eve accepted a different image, a different likeness. No longer were they covered with the glory of God, but were now standing there naked. Now they have made their choice and God now has a dilemma. Adam and Eve have willingly chosen to die by not believing and obeying God. We have a lot of voices in the world today. We have a lot of theories and what I think is actually seven point something billion people in the world. And that's how many voices is out there, including our own. But for Christians, one voice is prominent. One voice should be the one that we listen to. And that is God's voice. It shouldn't matter what we think. It shouldn't matter what we, what we want, what we're after. It's what God wants that matters to a Christian and to a Christian society, that's all that matters. Correct? Oh, we got that so far? So they, our full parents, Adam and Eve, decided that they did not want that. Innocent as it might have seemed, but that was their decision. They decided to follow, become under the influence of that little serpent. So there you have it. God now lost what? 
Not only did he lose his precious creation, but he lost his image in his creation. His image now is damaged, is tarnished, is no longer visible in these. The light disappeared from them. They're now standing there naked. Man was abandoned to the results of evil he had chosen. In the, in the sentence pronounced, Satan was given an intimate of redemption. This sentence spoken in the hearing of first parents was to them a promise. Before they, before they heard of the thorn and the thistles of toil and sorrow, that was their portion. Or to the dust we were able to return. They listened to the word, excuse me, to the words that could not fail of giving them hope. All that had been lost by yielding to Satan could be regained through Christ. Now we have in all of Christendom, we have Christ as the savior of the world. This is Christian, that's Christianity one-on-one. -on -one. Christ is the savior of the world. But is the whole world going to be saved? That's the, the, the thing that we sometimes we overlook in our zeal. Not purposely, I'm sure. But we so we, we have to assume that just because Christ died and gave his life for the world, that wasn't the end of it. That wasn't, that's not going to save anybody. Unless you choose for it to be served. So the first thing God wants to restore, and this is the first thing that he wants, is his image in us. That's what he wants to restore. All oh, this Genesis to Revelation is all part of that plan. All these stories, all the things we read, all the things we hear, that is all the part that God, that's what God is, is, is done all this for. And then we say, well, how are we going to do that? And it's one way to do. Because they weren't forced to disobey. The enemy didn't force them. They weren't forced or made to obey. So it has to come willingly, has to come willingly. And it has to come, excuse me, by love for him. By his love, we will willingly choose to live in trust and obedience to him. By love, by his love, we will willingly choose to live in trust and obedience to him. We, and this is not incorrect, we have a, a way of stating a relationship with God. And this is right. It's, it's got to remember what that type of relationship is. All relationships are different. Husband and wife, father, mother, children, and our relationship with God is creator and creature. That's our relationship. Our relationship is not evil. It's not like we're standing on evil footing with the almighty God. That's our relationship. So what happens? We have to learn that that is the best place for us. We, by the way they choose to disobey, we have to choose daily to obey. That's it. It's no trick. You, know, from, you can't find any other way in the Bible, biblical. You have people's ideas, and we all have an idea and opinion, but that's not biblical. The biblical way is we have to do it willingly, and we have to do it through love. Love is the factor that, that supersedes everything else. Love is the only conquering factor over all the things that, that, that ails us, that ails this world. 
that love. And it is that love that motivates us. Whether it's our love for ourselves or love for the world, it motivates our actions. That shouldn't be with God's people. God's people should be looking to what God loves. <laughs> Don't worry about nothing else. Don't worry about what you hear and all these things, all these theories. Go and see whatever that problem is. Go to see what God has to say about it. Go and read and study. Spend time in your closet to see what God wants. Because it doesn't matter how good it sounds. As a matter of fact, you hear a sermon, and that sermon makes you happy. It makes you feel good. It makes you, you know, feel better. It's not necessarily the best thing for you. <laughs> because a lot of times, if we're not encouraged, if we're not hearing a straight truth, if we're taking anything back, if we're holding anything back, then we're, 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 we're leading people into a false reality. So our, 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 our approach to not just hearing, but reading the word for ourselves, studying for ourselves, has to be an honest, truthful approach. It can't be an approach that is opinionated or because I am a Ventus, I have to read everything from this side or that side. Well, I'm a Catholic. I read things from this way or that way. We have to read things as God intended for us to read them with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's the way to do it. Because we find ourselves in a dilemma when we don't do it that way. And we choose to love or do the opposite of what God has for us to love and do. Supreme love for God and unselfish. Let me use my clicker. Oh, do you? How do you do that? Supreme, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not impulse, but, but a divine principle. You see that? A divine principle. A permanent power. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. So what does that tell us? You can't get it. It has to come from God. It has to come from God. The, 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 the love power that we all need to live the life God will have us to lead. All right. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns is it farm. We love him because he first loved us. You see, we didn't love him first. We learn love from Jesus. In the heart renewed by divine grace, love is, root, is the ruling principle of action. It modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passion, and enables the, ennobles the affections. This love cherishing the soul sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around us. God wants to recreate in us that his image. He lost it. He could have started over, but I don't think it, the Bible doesn't say he created any other creation in his own image. So it's like your child. You have a child or children and they go to school one day and they talk to their friend and, and the friend doesn't have to make up his bed because he doesn't have a bed, he sleeps on the floor. He doesn't have to take out trash and make sure it's out there safety because his family throws the trash out the window. So his family, he doesn't have to clean up because they clean up once a month. So all these things that this boy hears sounds intriguing. He ain't gonna make up his bed, then he ain't gonna be. Wonderful. I ain't gotta take out the trash. That's, that's, not, that's wonderful. I ain't gotta clean up. Wonderful. You don't have to do your, you don't have to do your handwork. Excuse me, you don't have to do your handwork. 
because you get to school and, and get somebody to do for you. Wonderful. So he convinced himself that that was better. That's what that's what's better. This, this is better. I don't have to do none of these things until he was allowed to go and live with him for a while. Parents said, okay, very smart parents. Go ahead. We ain't gonna try to stop you. You wanna go say Fauna was daddy, cockroaches everywhere. Your boy didn't tell him that. He didn't ask. He asked, did he have to make up his bed? He didn't have a bed. He slept on the floor with the cockroaches. So rats at the window, because that's where the trash goes are, you know? And uncapped environment. He didn't tell him that. This is the similar thing with the enemy. The enemy tells you all these lies, contrary to what God's trying to get you to, to, to live and love, and then you find out it's not so. The prodigal son is another example of, of that same situation. The prodigal son left him for a better life. He did not think that where he was was good enough. It, he needed to get out there and live life. That was his, his desire. And what happened to our dear prodigal son? He ended up in the peak style, 50 peaks. And then he decided to go back to his father's house. A lot of times we read the prodigal son and we all I, I can, can um, attest to his, his foolish mistakes myself. But the main story throughout the whole Bible is about God. It's not about these individuals and all of us. It's about God and what God wants for us. <laughs> And we can go to the so. so in the work of redemption, there is no compulsion, no external force to employ. Under the influence of the spirit of God, man is left free to choose whom he will serve. In the change that takes place when the soul surrenders to Christ, there is the highest sense of freedom. The expulsion of sin is the act of the soul itself. True. We have no power to free ourselves from Satan's control. But when we desire to be set free from sin and in our great need cry out for power out of and above ourselves, the powers of the soul are imputed with the divine energy of the Holy Spirit and they obey the dictate of the will in fulfilling the will of God. God has done everything for us. He's made plain who he is. And one of the, the most plain examples was Jesus himself. And if you could put up Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Matthew 7. 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So another example of you're not forced. You're not coerced. If you're being forced or coerced, it's not good. He just wants you to know him because that is the most important thing to God, that you know him and love him because of your knowledge of him. Therefore, you will again do what God wants for all of us to do. That's to obey his will, follow his leading, and he will take care of the rest. This says we don't have no power to free ourselves from Satan's control. This is what it says. But when we desire to be set free, and in our great need cry out for power out of and above ourselves, 
the powers of the soul are imputed with divine energy. The path which I have set before you is narrow, the gate is difficult of entry, for the good and rule excludes all pride and self-seeking. There is indeed a wider road, but its end is destruction. If you will climb the path of spiritual life, you must constantly ascend, for it is the upward way. You must go with a few, for the multitude will choose the downward path. Be as a body, as Christianity, as in, in Christianity as a body, we're starting to sound a lot more like the world than we should. And to 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 fit in, to make things easy, to make things smoother, we kind of take a little bit of compromise in here and there. God does not recognize compromises. God does not accept a little bit of sin. God cannot accept that. It's always a story too about if grace is um. Like if a police officer stops you speeding, right? And he comes up to your car and you're the guilty as anything. <laughs> and he looks at you, accepts your, your humble sorriness and says, okay, I'm gonna give you a break. Go ahead, you're ready. That is similar to what this grace is, it's similar. But the real grace that we accept from God, because remember, God did not break the rules to save us. You know? He didn't. He didn't break the law to save us. You know? Somebody had to die. You understand that? Jesus had to die. So it's not like that priest letting you up. It's actually you getting booked. You go into court because the policeman doesn't have the right to let you up. His broke the law. Get me? So when you go to the judge now, the judge has that power, judicial discretion. He has the power to let you off. That's where you get this type of grace. It's a story too about a commissioner. A commissioner, um, long Christmas time, they had this horrific breaking at this home, and an elderly lady was killed. And his top detective was on it and he decided to go to the husband and the, and the son to console them and to get the story. He wanted to do this himself. This is the commission. So he went and he sat down with the father and the son and the father told him he, when he came downstairs, nothing, nobody was there. Everybody was, the, person, the perpetrator was born. So anyway, a day or so later, he's talking to his detective. He says, look, you know how the case, he said, well, I think it's the daddy. I think it's your husband. The commissioner said, hey, what are you talking about? I sat down with him. I looked in his eyes. No way that's happening. So after a little bit of, of um, investigating on his own, found out that was true. So then he went there to confront the, 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 the husband and the son. The son says, let me show you something. Pulled out a tape that the mother had, had made popped the tape in and there she was sitting there explaining to her husband why this needed to be done. She was terminally ill and she didn't want him to suffer. She loved him. She wanted the best for him. She said, look, this is the best thing for us to do. Anyway, she couldn't do it. This was a suicide note or tape. She couldn't do it. So he helped her, right? He helped her. So the guy in tears in his eyes, the commissioner he said, okay, you can arrest me. He said, no, I'm going to arrest you. Man, then he couldn't shake it. Man, talking to his wife, said, baby, I, I'm going to arrest him, but I can't do it. I've got to do it because I'm, I'm by the law. I'm obligated to do it by the law. So she's saying, well, babe, you know, Take your time, make the right decision, whatever. So he had another situation on his hands as well. And the consul 
was called, the town council called him to a special meeting. They wanted him to do, the head of the council wanted him to do a certain thing. He wasn't going to do it. So they gave him an ultimatum. He did, or else he quit. I'm quitting. Left. The next day he goes to the office. The secretary is sitting there saying, Mr. Smith's inside your office. And he's going to pack up. Goes inside, Mr. Smith's there saying, I know why you quit. You didn't quit because of that. You quit because of me. You didn't want to arrest me. But I'm here to turn myself in. Right? This is what he done. He wanted to turn himself in. And he says, okay, well, how can I help? Da, 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 da. So where do I go? They had that little chat and he told him where to go. He said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to walk you there. So he walked the guy to the place, right? And um, um, half an hour later, the lady comes into him. Oh, we have changed our ruling on the, pre the other case and what voted it for you and we don't want you to resign and all of this. So it worked out where he, um, it, it worked out in the end, but the, the principle of it was that he couldn't break the law. He was the commissioner. And the same principle applies to God. God couldn't break the law. He couldn't break the law to save us. And he wouldn't because the law is who he is. So that's why Jesus had to die for us and give, not only die, because in this preparation, he was tortured. He didn't, they didn't just kill him. Satan was allowed a certain leeway of Christ. They, he tortured our savior before they killed him. So that's the, that's the answer to the law. So grace is not what you assume a policeman could do for you. It's what a judge can do for you who has that authority. You know, what a judge can do for you. So I thought that was interesting that we, we, as we want things to say this or that, it's not always that accurate, you know? Okay, um, let's see if I can get to. Did I get the next one? Okay, could someone read this for us? This is. It should be the determination of every soul, not so much to seek to understand all about the conditions that will prevail in the future state, as to know what the law requires of him in this life. It is the will of God that each professing Christian should perfect their character after the divine signature. By studying the character of Christ, revealed in the Bible, by practicing his virtues, the believer will be changed into the same likeness of goodness and mercy. Christ's work of self-denial and sacrifice brought into the daily lives the development of faith that works by love and shows by the soul. There are many who wish to invade the cross-bearing heart, but the Lord speaks to all when he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Okay, one of my um, favorite scriptures is that scripture. Let any man, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We have to take this in simplitude, as it says somewhere up there. Divine to, to say to me what it says. Denying ourselves is the hardest thing because by, by the nature that Adam and Eve accepted, it's the opposite. And you've got an excuse for everything that happens. And sometimes you're using a biblical excuse. Sometimes you're justifying it. Because, oh, the word says this. Mm -hmm. But guess what? What I find is this. The Bible 
from Genesis to Revelation has one theme. If what you're reading goes against that theme, you're reading it wrong. You're reading it wrong. You're misinterpreting it because it has to tie in with the theme of the Bible. It has to. And the theme of the Bible is that God wants to restore us to his image. God loves us, but God cannot break the law for us. So you can go to heaven sinning. I don't care who tells you that. It's not biblical. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a slap in God's face. How oh, God can break the law for you? He could have broke the law if I was sending Jesus there, huh? He didn't need to send Jesus to be tortured and killed just to be able to break the law to save you or me. So we've got to recognize that this sin is a disease that only the love of God can cure. Surrendering to God with all your heart, soul, and mind is the only cure. It's no other way. It's no philosophy. It's no yoga. It's no meditation. It's none of these things. None of these things will do any good for us. We're sick. And God is the only one that can that heal us. He's the only one. And the only way to heal us is what Jesus done. Jesus willingly done that. Willingly. God, God crucified. And then God came willingly to show us what? To show us God's love for us. To show us God's love also for his law, who he is. He showed us that God loves his law. Because why else would he agree to that? You know, so we've got to look at it both ways. As Christians, it's imperative that we get it right. Because we are the ones that's going to show the world how to get it right. If not, if we're blending in and going off the multitude, then who's going to, who, do, if we're not got no flavor, who's going to solve the world? So the, 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 the fact of the matter is that, uh, I'll clear this up, but the fact of the matter, now let's get to the next slide. Okay, sister. You see that? Yeah. You see all that? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is not my words. <laughs> this comes from me, month of blessing. You can't go in there. You're clinging to be sad and sin. You find your way to narrow scans. You won't be able to get through. Your ways, your own ways, your own will. You see that? What's the first word that comes out of our mouth most of the time? I think, or I want, or I know, my opinion is Christians, me, <laughs> first things out of our mouth. You know what should be the first thing out of our mouth? What does God want? What does God think? Jesus fought the enemy all. Tell me, how are you fighting? <laughs> it is written, it's even debate. 
He didn't give his opinion. He didn't give a, a sermon. He just told him what the Bible says. That's us. That's another example of us. There were questions, there were jumped on or whatever. Quote, learn your Bible and quote your Bible. Don't give somebody your opinion because they might have a better argument than you. Because y'all, y'all got to remember, we have faith. They might have figures. The, the, the point is, all of these things, heaven's path is too narrow for rank and riches to ride in state, too narrow for the play of self-centered ambition, too steep and rugged for lovers of ease to climb. I think of, and, and Sarn is so, I mean, the church is so good for putting on the, the, um, the, yes, the mission story. Because when you really look at it, you look at some of those, those people in their stories, I don't measure up to them. Honestly. And, and you're looking at it like, these are people. How Luther would need. <laughs> For studying his Bible, you know, he couldn't get it enough. Beg God, give me a Bible so I can read it. I have four Bibles, struggling to try to get in and do what God had me to do. The, the gentleman, and I couldn't find his name, he was the one who saved his money for three years. And, and these guys and these people have an, a, a a God first approach. That's what's needed now. What do we live in ease? <laughs> it, it's too rugged for us. It's too steep for us because we live in ease. So these, these words, these, this, this advice, this, this ammunition is for us as a church to follow. It's not about if we have a good opinion about something or a, 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 a thought on what this says and it's not really accurate. We have to make sure that what we're saying is accurate. What we're saying is backed up by what the Bible has to say about it. So I, I just want you to, to take this, this, this down and read it for yourself and then keep it close. Because at times we need reminded. And that's, that's, um, so before we, there's a, in, let's go back. Okay. All right. By disobedience, this was forfeited. No, that's not the one. What was it? This one. Again, but by disobedience, this was forfeited. Through sin, the divine likeness was marred and well nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were weakened. His mental capacity was lessened. His spiritual vision dimmed. He had become subject to death. Yet the race was not without hope. Um, Could you put up... Matthew 6, 33. Sister? But seek 
her the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I, I want to just encourage us as we go forward from day to day that this is our desire. It's not what the world has to say. There's a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of people saying a lot of things. But this should be our, our lot. We should be learning and praying and asking for what God wants. That's the only thing that's important to a Christian. Because otherwise, we're not going to make it through this narrow phase. It's going to be too hard for us. It's going to be too narrow for us. It's going to become impossible for us to do. God's way, through his love, the Bible has, has described that love that a man gives up his life like no other for another. His love was generated in such a way that we don't always take it as serious as we should. We, we, we hear it so much, we, 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 we get used to it, but really reflect on how deep that is. Not just his love for us, but his love for his Lord and what he wants. That's most important for us as we close out. First Thessalonians 5, 3. Say yes, that was me. But when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. As, a, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So be careful of the peace and safety words or, or how smooth those words sound to us. Because sudden destruction will come upon those that are not ready. We have parables all through the Bible. Jesus gave, Jesus gave many, the five virgins, 10 virgins and five foolish and five wise is another prime example. All these things were what leads to the kingdom. The kingdom is likened unto. We have to take those examples as Christians. You can't expect to find it in the world. Don't go to Oprah or somebody looking for it. You're not going to find it. You have to go to the word. And we have to believe in what the word says. And we have to follow according to as God, God has at least. So God only wants what's rightfully his in the first place. That's all he wants. What, was, what is rightfully his. He created us. He created this world. You got a, 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 a fallen angel down there claiming both. Claiming us and the world. God only wants what is already rightfully his. And the only way we can be successful with that is that we follow what he wants and not what we want. Amen. Thank you, Denton. I, I was just thinking to myself that we're so privileged. We've got Bibles on our shelves and people are, have just got a page in some places, just one page. And um, we need to realize how precious our Bible is. And thank you for that, Denton. Um, it's now time for our closing hymn, so if you'd like to stand and we'll sing number 86, How Great Thou Art.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, how great thou art. You are above our, our thoughts. You are good and good alone. You are without equal. And we pledge ourselves to you as rightfully belonging to you in the first place. So we pray for the healing from the sin sick body for each one of us, creating us clean new hearts of flesh, we pray, that love righteousness and hate sin. We thank you, Lord, for what you want for us and what we desire for ourselves as well, because it's you that puts in us the will and to, and to do, be able to do your good pleasure. So please continue to be with us the remainder of the Sabbath day. Be with those in Birmingham. We pray that your spirit is with them and your angels are protecting them. And we pray for your presence here with all of us. And we thank you once again for dear Maria and her baptism. And we pray that you will continue your work, not just in her, but all of us to prepare us for your soon return. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving, amen.